Hi, everybody. Today, I will uh, show you the Italian work toward an interoperability framework that aims to uh, go beyond SOAP. Okay, we will start uh, spotting the main issues we had with the actual SOAP framework. Then we will see uh, what changed in the HTTP world that could uh, enable us to move uh, from uh, SOAP to REST. And finally, the standardization and reliability features we had introduced in the new framework. Uh, finally, I will show you some ideas uh, on which your feedback is very welcome. But before uh, everything, I work in the um, Italian digital team. Uh, if, you want, if, you want to, if you want to ask, uh, working for the Italian government is, is wonderful, uh, at least uh, until you are uh, in the digital team. We are 30 people. Uh, quite skilled, and we strive to make public services uh, more accessible for citizens and business, uh, introducing um, an approach to reliability and to reliable uh, architectures in the public administration world. That is, it's a very tough work, and everything we want to be um, based on API because it's a nice way and a machine-readable way to communicate. Uh, who I am, I'm taking care of the API ecosystem uh, in the digital team. At first, uh, essentially, the government world uh, have always been a closed world, an enterprise world, but now, we want to move this approach from an enterprise closed approach to a broader uh, web approach, a distributed approach. This was the old SOAP framework. Uh, you see it, it's complex. It's, uh, it has a lot of layers. Uh, Administration created services, and then they had an enterprise service bus taking care of communication, internal communication, while external communication should transit to a very custom, ad hoc and specific SOAP gateway that takes care of a further encapsulation. Then it communicates on a private network, a private governmental network, uh, to another sub gateways that they encapsulate and so on. It's, it's complex, it's costly, and uh, moreover, it, it has problem with our reliability because it's complex to do service management in this kind of environment. Why this complex? Because uh, SOAP does communicate issues with only one HTTP status code that is 500, and everything is into an envelope. It's in an XML. So errors uh, are serialized in, in XML on the SB, then deserialized and then eventually re-serialized on the SOAP gateway, which then creates a further envelope and transmits uh, it abroad. So the issue is that there is no universal semantic for communicating errors. And when does things go bad? Well, when you are on peak loads, because you cannot do service management. And you have a system that is overloaded with requests. For example, uh, the city of Rome is roundly 3 million people. Uh, on the day, on the tax paying days, you have nearly 3 to 9 million requests only on the um, city of Rome. And imagine what can happen when you have a 60 million people country on tax paying days, then when people just remember uh, on mm, Friday morning, 
uh, that they have to pay taxes, and they uh, all make requests between 9 a.m. to uh, 12 a.m., all charging uh, the uh, ecosystem. Uh, those kind of issues are, I mean, uh, everyday issues, and you mean you have millions of requests that should be serviced in four hours. And when this is going to break, in during peak loads, because processing error is costly. Okay, so you add uh, further uh, CPU and RAM uh, work even when there are uh, peak loads. And moreover, uh, all these became a barrier. This worked well for 13 years, but now is a barrier for the creation of new services. It is very expensive, both on setup and on operational costs. It complicates communication with the private sector because if you are a private a uh, company that want to interact with all the public health government staff, you need the ESB and the uh, customs of gateway and so on. Uh, uh, moreover, the IT world was moving toward SOAP. So, okay, we now um, started to, to think if the IT world moved forward SOAP, why can we? SOAP is old, but uh, again, it was born because uh, there, were, there were many weak points in the format HTTP uh, specs, and uh, it added uh, essentially one layer on the underlying protocol that is not necessarily HTTP. You can send some messages on HTTP, on SMTP, whatever. And uh, as SOAP is based on messages, it is virtually asynchronous. But today, we have this brand new, nice, uh, wonderful semantics that is RFC 723239, actually. Uh, there are even a lot of work on uh, HTTP now. Uh, uh, almost all services, not only web services, but even mail services and directory services now are uh, inherently based on HTTP. And now we found that the network is reliable enough for having synchronous exchanges. So uh, it does not always sense to transport messages on SMTP. It is fine, I mean, but it's not always a requirement because our system message or s messages are always online. So we can go synchronous. We can uh, have instant messaging, we can have chats and so on. So we can actually move uh, beyond SOAP. Uh, these new semantics allow us to route requests uh, based on path and method, we don't necessarily have to process messaging to know how to balance them from it important or non important, that you can just read like read only or read write or when I do have to cache or not. Uh, I can use a status and headers that is a sort of reading the, the payload, but it's not actually reading the whole body uh, of all the records body. Uh, so uh, I can just limit to um, status and headers. Moreover, I got a lot of semantic for caching, con conditional, and even range requests. So this new framework wants to standardize API uh, without SOAP. That doesn't mean we just uh, can sell SOAP, but we expect new uh, services will be provided through uh, REST API. We want to enforce an API-first approach based on OpenAPI v3, that is the standards uh, formerly known as Zwogger. And we added a scheme standardization based on standards and a new availability strategy based on distributed circuit breaker and throttling patterns. That means we enforce 
all API uh, released by the government agencies to implement throttling and circuit breaker. And this is the shiny new ecosystem we want to implement where every agency uh, implements API that could be meshed up and we could create new and new services mixing uh, uh, national registry and PHR, uh, that is the, your personal health record, that are provided by certain trial government, together with services provided by schools and town, and the school can inquire to the um, revenue system if you need uh, or if you are eligible for grants, and the hospital uh, can uh, contact the town or your personal that record if, to see, for example, if you, have, uh, if you are allergic uh, or intolerant to something. And this is our actual goal, provide and mesh up services for the citizen. Because uh, the main goal for the administration, and this is sometimes when you speak with the administration, you have to repeat to them, your goal is to serve citizen. Usually administration uh, think they, their goal is to create documents. And once they have provided documents, they're done. But you have to remember it. And sometimes uh, you'll find somebody that understands. And this will become a turning point because uh, he will remember um, and he will uh, be somebody that follows you and understand uh, the actual goal of the administration. And magically they understand the new ecosystem and then they understand we can get rid of soap. So standardization, let's come on the tech stuff. Okay, only HTTPS. We banned uh, HTTP and binary message. That means if your administration has a new Kafka, JMS, AMQP, shining uh, cluster, simply they cannot expose it on the internet, but they have to provide an uh, HTTP uh, wrapper that should provide authentication, authorization via mutual TLS or, or open API, or, um, uh, open ID connect or OAuth. This is not because Kafka is not good, but because you have to standardize things and Kafka actually is not a standard. Kafka allows you to implement a binary uh, communication system. But while HTTP enables to write specs where you communicate in a standard way, so you can move from Kafka to MQP or GMS, and the other government agencies, just they doesn't need to know. And let me say, they don't have to know if you use Kafka or MQP. They just have to know uh, which is your interface with the external services. And then we want today to uh, leverage status, method, and path, because it is important not only to provide, provide fast services, but we need auditing and routing, because usually when you are in the government staff, you need uh, usually to treat uh, people, uh, data, personal data, and so it's better to uh, trade off some speed for the ability to have a unique and trustworthy system of encryption and uh, authentication and authorization based on well-known protocols. Then, this is easy. Uh, just stop logging in that way, but just log in RFC 5424, that is uh, syslog, because uh, so you don't have to care about New Year's Day, you don't have to care about daylight saving time, and if I have to uh, cross-check logs from two administration, I don't have to pay um, external services or external company to write expensive uh, 
log parser, but I have to simply uh, just send you the logs, uh, and that's fine. Well, uh, this ontology-based schema, what's that? Uh, essentially, in um, the Italian law uh, states that uh, except for some exceptions, uh, public organization should release open source in the wild on GitHub for everybody to use their software. But then one of the issues you have is that their web service uh, just serialized the given name in tens of possible different ways. While in Italy we have an ontology that is a, a well-known and established schemas that say that the given name is named, that is given name and not name nor first name. Uh, the same for the tax code, the same for the VAT number. So uh, we expect in a couple of two or three years to get rid of all, of all those serialization um, variables and uh, to have a, a converge to a simple and unique serialization stuff that will save a lot of time of um, unit testing when two organizations communicate. Because if I say, let's say, uh, the revenue service say call um, given name and the health service calls um, first name, you have to provide a converter and you should test that all exchanges work. So this is a standardizing name is probably the most uh, complex part because everybody wants to retain the old names. But on the other part, we esteem to save a lot of money in uh, two or three years and to eventually provide for public administration a set of library for personal information management uh, that could provide validation and so on at the central level. So if you have to implement um, or to manage personal information, you can just reuse the future uh, to come library. So another part, reliability. This was the main goal behind the new framework. Uh, we started from the uh, European interoperability framework. If you are in the architecture world, it's a good read. It's actually a very good read. Uh, it doesn't go too much in, in the tech, but it goes uh, too much in um, requirements. And if you want to work in the government world, you have to motivate that the change you are introducing came from the European Union, because this is your passport to for motivating administration to change. And actually, I think it's a well-written document. So what does he say? He says that um, if you provide government services, you have to plan, uh, you, you have to write up a business continuity plan. It means a few, but it could mean a lot. For example, if you provide your services through a public cloud, it means you have to implement a multi-availability zone strategy. Or if you provide the service in your data center, it means that you have to provide a disaster recovery in two cities, or at least in two different data centers. So um, it means for us, on the interoperability stuff, not on the architectural stuff, that you should uh, provide an integrated management on load and failures. That means if your infrastructure is overloaded, you should communicate it in a machine-readable way to the others. Because this avoids cascading failures, which are actually one of the main issues in governmental services especially when you have um, pay infrastructure behind. Because, for example, you want to pay a tax. You um, talk with your home banking. Your home banking will uh, contact both the uh, service payment uh, system 
of the government and the um, remote public agencies. So it's a three level, um, it's a three level architecture between different both public and private uh, agencies. Uh, it's something like that, but it, it, the payment service is too complex. So for example, if the um, tax office uh, API is overloaded, you still contact your um, own banking, but your requests are going to go in timeout because the public infrastructure that is behind cannot service the request. And this puts a load on your home banking. They have actual transaction that are failing. So you have, for example, a transaction ID on PayPal, and then they tell you that the transaction number X failed. The new framework provides a way to, in the case, the service uh, is not available, or if it is overloaded, okay? So if it's up and running, but it's queue, it's service queue, it's API queue, call, is too long, the, you can use an API management that return a, a saturation response that is just plain 503, service unavailable plus retry after, that could be Retry after one hour, five minutes, tomorrow. In this way, the payment service, your own banking, can know that it doesn't have to still issue more payment services. But it can just say, OK, this payment service is overloaded. I want to issue new calls for five minutes for 10 minutes, or for example, if this service is a real-time service that works only from 9 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m., it will service requests all in, in a given time frame, but now the service C that relies on service B knows the time when it can start and issue new requests. And this is very important because it gives hints on the organization one to communicate to the user that actually his request, his services is up, but his request cannot be serviced in five minutes, one hour, 12 hours. So how can you do this? Okay, you have to tell people uh, to implement this, but you haven't even communicate which are the HTTP headers. Because as you can see on the left, there are uh, at least 12 different possible HTTP headers that you can use to implement this. And if you make a standardization server application relying on external services, can just check those three, that is, rate limit, limit, remaining, and reset. And just don't have to guess and check all those possible headers. So the important thing uh, is to reduce and be clear on which are the supported headers. And um, on the last one, the late remit reset tells you essentially if you are over quota, when you can start again issuing new requests, uh, just tell them how many seconds they have to wait. Because if you put a timestamp or a date, uh, if the, um, you have to rely on your NTP server or, or on their NTP server, well, in this way, even if the clock is queued, they just wait for enough seconds. Moreover, uh, this approach is semantically consistent with another header that is actually an, in the HTTP standard, that is the retry after header. So always tell if they are going to saturate their queues. Moreover, when they are over quota or the service is overloaded 
or out of service communicate how long before the new request has to arrive. Then, this is wonderful, this is easy. Uh, there is a standard for JSON resp error response. Just use it. And then, this, this is was uh, almost all. Then, future steps. Standardized metrics use rates, not absolutes, because when you have to communicate service status, you probably want to communicate uh, your, um, your metrics. So, which is the fragrance, which is the base Unix, which is your availability. Um, the old framework used more than 20 different metrics. Some was um, the higher the better, some other was uh, rates, other was absolutes. We say just use um, rates, not absolutes. Use basic units, just like Prometheus, that is bytes a second. Use availability, uh, availability, expose success rates, not error rates. For example, availability. The service was up for the 95% of the time. Or success rate, uh, the service responded uh, nicely to the 95% of the request. Uh, they must pick a response, expected response time. And we are actually uh, thinking if to use a responsiveness that is a quite tricky matrix to evaluate or an updex index that just use the target response time to create an index that is from zero to one and it's quite readable and quite usable. If you have, uh, if you have suggestion on that, please, those are welcome. Then, the hard part, the tough part, is signature and the encryption. Signing an exchange with a digital certificate is the basis for a non-repudiation framework. That is, if I send something to a public administration, I have a sort of receipt that can guarantee me that uh, the counterpart cannot deny the exchange. Uh, SOAP as a well-established standard, that is, well, well-established but criticized standard for signing an encryption that is uh, WS security, and rest are some standard, still criticized, criticized that there is JSON web signatures and encryption, uh, encryption namely JWS and JWE, um, that are used by OpenID Connect, for example. We are uh, investigating, still working on all that stuff, the possible choices we have are, one, leave the signature and the encryption to the application protocol, for example, to the, to, to the administration. Uh, sign just the body, that is what WS security does, so we can just extend a JSON object with claims or adding HTTP headers with a signature or another approach that is um, undergoing uh, on Amazon, and there are a couple of drafts, um, is to create a signature of request header and body and put everything in the HTTP headers. Uh, there are some proposals and there are many issues, but it's, I mean, interesting. It's an interesting research stuff. Further discussions uh, are on digital certificate. I'm uh, lurking on this uh, web uh, work group. Uh, they consider RSA uh, a legacy, but well, it, it's, it's not that you say, just don't do RSA. I mean, uh, you should think well because uh, it's something uh, we have to think at least with a 10 years uh, perspective. 
the advantage of um, considering RSA a legacy is that uh, elliptic curves keys are very short and they are easily embeddable in HTTP headers or in claim. Uh, on headers, there is something new in HTTP2 are those structured headers. You can see uh, the second uh, stuff enclosed with stars is actually um, base Santa Quat 64, base 64 encoded binary. So the advantage of structured headers is that you can embed binary stuff into headers uh, in a standard way. So when you get stuff that is enclosed, it, it's just bits 64 encoded. And well, another discussion, but it's really too much for a conference, whether to deprecate or adopt the digest header. If you use it, please take care of reading the carefully, both the digest header um, RFC and all the proceedings of a couple of um, HTTP workgroup group uh, conference papers because it seems, seems nice, but could be tricky. Well, I think that I made a quite nice run. I hope I didn't bore you enough. If you are interested on the new Italian framework, actually it is in uh, Italian, but uh, I'm working with the uh, GDS, that is the uh, United Kingdom uh, Digital Services. Uh, I started some preliminary uh, talk on, on this work. There are some similarities, some differences, but uh, uh, we, are, um, we just started uh, last month, but we made a lot of calls uh, to try to find some uh, common grounds. And we we'll even start some first interaction with the uh, French government. And so there, there is the opportunity to create really um, an European framework for API. There will be a European conference uh, in October. I hope to make it there. And if you're interested in uh, this stuff, uh, please uh, let me know and I will provide all the English documentation I can. And well, thank you very much. Uh, again, you can write me on Twitter or until um, on my institutional email. Again. If there are questions. Uh, place for questions, come, come up here. Any questions? So thanks for, for the talk, it was very interesting. I'm glad to see that also Italy is kind of uh, progressing on this and I'm glad to see also to, to see that there is some conversation with the UK government. I think they are quite good in uh, digitalizing all the services. They have a very good uh, GitHub account with yes. a thousand repositories, so I think it's good. So uh, the question is, I have a couple of questions. So what um, are the first uh, services that users, uh, citizens will use uh, that, um, using these new technologies if you have targeted some specific service? And um, the second one, as is uh, all these work is open source, how, what's the process of uh, accepting pull requests or uh, contribution from uh, from the community. Okay, actually, the main services are related to to data. For example, uh, the queue. In if you go to the uh, ER in the hospital, um, all those uh, data are usually exposed by API, so you can know. Uh, for example, if you are in a big city you may know uh, which are the, the hospital with the longest queue or, or the lowest queue. And uh, the lot of work is based for the citizen is still based on, um, on data. Uh, there are some um, 
our first target instead are some um, frequently used services provided between administrations that will be uh, uh, based on uh, REST API, but with mutual authentication with TLS, essentially, because those are a backbone where um, local and smallest uh, public uh, um, agencies like towns can build services on top. So um, the first goal to me is to uh, unlock some services just like the tax code validation uh, that it seems simple, but it is not because, for example, a tax code of a dead person is not valid. So there is a service that provides an actual validation to check if the, the tax code is um, attached to a valid uh, uh, person, a, a real life person or a real uh, company. And this is used billions uh, of times, and it could be used, for example, to provide a real validation of all forms uh, of the citizen provided by the citizen. That are usually when you uh, fill up a form and you specify your tax code, uh, they usually validate just, they make a syntactical validation. Or, for example, if your driving license is valid, those are core services that are very frequently used that could be easily scale. And if you move them uh, in, uh, in, with this approach, uh, it will gain a lot of benefits. For the, um, uh, about the, the open source stuff, uh, actually we have almost uh, 190 repositories in the um, Italian, go Italian government account. And we are working hard with uh, the central administration because uh, through the law um, tells that they have to release in the open source, uh, there are no sanction for not doing that. So um, he, you have to check the project, you have to help them because uh, releasing is not open source, is not just uh, throwing out whatever it is. I mean, you should provide a quality software, you should provide software that could be documented enough for the organization to get contribution. But now there is one of the main projects, it's a new project we are working on, is um, messaging uh, service for people where uh, through a um, mobile app, you could receive payment notification, uh, you could receive fines, for example, or uh, announcements uh, on your, um, or your uh, healthcare data. And uh, every, uh, um, this uh, application is backed by a, an, an API a service that can receive and deliver messages to the citizen on their phone and then can, they can, through the application, register a wallet to the, um, in Italy we have a Pago Pia that is sort of a peg of UK um, that, it, uh, that started in uh, almost four years ago. And um, the nice thing is that you can use this uh, payment service to re register your credit card and payment services to pay, um, to pay taxes and so on. And this app is fully open source. The infrastructure is fully open source. You can, you can get it and use it. It is very well documented. It's on GitHub and the documentation is in Markdown like mostly all the new Italian government uh, project. So we have time for one more question. Uh, I just wanted to quickly mention um, there's a project uh, called uh, COSE, COS, um, which is RFC 8152, and that's a signing and encryption protocol, which might be useful to you. I saw one of the slides you mentioned. 
we were looking at different um, options for that, and I just wanted to mention. Just that. let me know. Um, RFC. RFC eight one five two. Yeah, uh, it's based on um, on uh, C bar. It's yeah. I, I think it's used. Um, uh, it's used another way of um, serializing the object. Uh, it's very interesting. There is the um, one of the uh, Senate exchanges that uh, partly use C bar and, uh, and and this. I think uh, I don't know if actually all these specification because it seems. Uh, I, I will show you. This Seabor stuff is actually very interesting. And uh, essentially, uh, the Seabor is a seri binary serialization of JavaScript. Uh, uh, using the header notation I showed you before, the star one, you can just create a, and serialize a JavaScript object in a binary one and serialize and put it in a header. Uh, in a standard way. And well, thank you very much. And it would be interesting if uh, to call with uh, to, to have a talk with you uh, on on that matter. So I'm done. Thank you very much for all your patience. I hope uh, it was uh, interesting enough, even if it's a, a public uh, public project. But public and government can be good and fun. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you to you. Goodbye.